right, so good morning. Welcome to week number two in our series, Minor Moments in the Old Testament. I hope you have been able to dig yourself out from the snow this week. Uh, last week, we looked at a passage that was really interesting, uh, but it was really a victim of its own location. And in it, we saw some beautiful foreshadowing of Jesus Christ being God's appointed mediator for us uh, it was a beautiful passage. But this week, this week it's not so much an issue of location, although some may argue it is. Uh, this passage is fairly unknown because it consists of only two verses in 2 King. And for anyone who would read it, we would probably just scratch our heads and say, well, that was weird, and just move on. Uh, but there is, as with every other verse in the Bible, something that we can learn. Nothing is put in Scripture by accident. It is all valuable and important. And if we understand the context, we can even apply each and every verse to our lives today. I know it's crazy. I know it's crazy. But we can learn how to better live from Scripture, right? crazy. So let's go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. That was sarcasm if you didn't know. 2 Kings chapter 2. Um, and let me remind you again, we will be having Rhonda Samples come and share about LifeWise, uh, a biblically based program that will be starting at Fairview School District this fall. Uh, she is going to be coming on, this, on February 27th. And I also believe on February 27th, when she comes to share, she will be giving ideas and opportunities on how we can serve in this ministry. So please, you will want to be here on the 27th. There will be no live stream that week. So the only place to see this will be here. So come on out. Let me encourage you to come out, please. Uh, this is an important program that will help give a biblical worldview to our children in the area, which is so important, and we will see why a little bit later. Uh, so February 27th, please be here. All right, so as for our passage, let me give you some background on 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2 starts off with Elijah hiking along from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho and then finally to the Jordan River. And all along this trek, Elisha is traveling with him, knowing that the time of Elijah's death is near. Now, Elijah is constantly stay, saying, hey, God has called me to Bethel. God has called me to Jericho. God has called me to the Jordan. And he keeps telling Elijah to stay here, wherever they're at. And Elijah says, no, I want to come with you. And so the two continue to travel together from one city to the next, knowing the end is near. And as you read chapter two, uh, knowing that the end is near, uh, as you read it, you can almost feel that it is this unwritten lament in this chapter. And so Elisha, the understudy, if you will, the apprentice, longing to spend each possible moment with his master, even as he knows God is about to take him away, continues to walk with Elijah, gleaning as much as he can as they walk together. Uh, and it is here just before Elijah is whisked away. He turns and looks at Elijah, Elisha, in verse 9. And he says, when they had crossed, when they had crossed, that's the Jordan River, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha replies, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, let me point out that this is probably not what you think it means. Oftentimes, we Westerners would think, well, 
Elisha is saying, well, Elijah, you were an amazing prophet. I want to be twice as good as you. But that's not what, is, what this means. Uh, when we look at the, con the cultural context that this was set in by, uh, at that time, uh, what happens is when a parent would die, and Deuteronomy tells us this, and Deuteronomy 21 tells us this, when a parent would die, uh, it mentions that the firstborn is to receive a double share of all that he has. So in other words, if the parent dies, everything they have would be divided up among the siblings, but the firstborn gets twice as much as the other siblings, okay? So Elijah is not asking to be twice as good as the prophet. But instead, out of all that Elijah was in relationship with God, that God would allow him to inherit a portion large enough to carry out the work that God had called him to do. That's what he is asking for. To which Elijah says, uh, You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not and so this idea of who is elijah to determine such a thing uh, to me it kind of harkens back to jesus when james and john came and said hey let us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand and jesus says you don't know what you're asking but anyways elijah lays out how elisha may be blessed with this double portion and it happens and I'll let you read about it and so Elisha after the passing of Elijah begins to retrace the steps that they have traveled Elijah goes back over the Jordan um, he goes back uh, back through Jericho and now he's heading back to Bethel which is where our minor moment occurs. Uh, Elisha is heading towards Bethel when all of a sudden, 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 23, says this, From there, Elisha went up to Bethel, and he was walking along the road. Some youths came out from the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. Go on up you bald head he turned around looked at them and called down a curse on them in the name of the lord then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths and he went on to mount carmel and from there returned to samaria yep you read that right elisha as he went up to Bethel, was confronted by some youths and that came out of the town just to make fun of him. And as the story goes, he decides to call down a curse of God upon them. And God appoints two bear to come out and maul 42 of them. Whew. So why is this a minor moment? Why do we not hear about this odd occurrence more often well because honestly it's it's hard to deal with it takes a lot of work to truly understand what's going on here i mean there is so little here and yet such violence that takes place initiated by a loving god just because they were teasing elisha it just it doesn't seem fair and so it requires us to gather a lot of context throughout Scripture in order to understand these two verses. So let me kind of give us some context from back in the day, way back in the day, uh, there was a king named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam did evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, Jeroboam did so much evil, he set up false idols and altars all throughout the land of Israel, including a city named Bethel. And there in that city and other cities, he also appointed priests and high places all in this 
city of Bethel. Well, a little later, a king named Ahab came along, and the Bible says that Ahab was even worse than Jeroboam. The Bible says that, quote, he, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, but he also married Jezebel. I think we've heard of her once or twice, right? And he began to serve Baal and worship him. So needless to say, the continued worship of Baal continued in the various cities, including Bethel. And then as Ahab passed away, the next king up was a king named Ahaziah. Ahaziah uh, was a horrible king as well. In fact, 1 Kings closes with the verse that says Ahaziah did evil in the eyes of the Lord because he walked in the ways of his father and mother and in the ways of Jeroboam who caused Israel to sin. It goes on to say he served and worshipped Baal and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger just as his father had done. And that's the way 1 King ends. Now, our passage picks up shortly after the death of King Ahaziah. And the new king, Jehoram, didn't really do anything to abolish the Baal worship that was taking place throughout the land. And so it was into this context that Elisha walks into. He walks into a city that has been set up as a center to worship Baal many, 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 many years ago. A city that Elijah had recently, just a couple days ago, accompanied him through and I'm sure caused a few waves, right? It is at this time that Elisha, on his return, runs into some resistance. Now, we finally get to the part that I want to spend some time on here in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. It says, From there Elijah went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came out of the town and jeered at him. Go, up, go on up, you bald head, he said. Go on up, you bald head. So the first thing we need to learn is, it is not wise to make fun of bald people. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to point out so that we better understand this passage. First, depending on what type, what uh, translation of scripture you have, some use, some of the translations say children. Uh, some say young men. So the question instantly I have, and maybe you do as well, is what are we talking about here? Because a God who would wipe out a bunch of four and five-year-old children, that just doesn't seem right. Now, honestly, so, so when you look at this, honestly, the word used here for youths or children or young men, uh, this word has a wide meaning. But as a reference this word is the word, the spies, the spies that Joshua sent to spy on Jericho. They were designated by this same word. And so most scholars claim the age to be between 12 and 30 years old. So we're talking teenagers up to late 20s. All right. And so when we understand that, it makes me feel that this is surely more than just a couple of kids picking on poor Elisha. And the reason I think it's more than just a couple of kids picking on poor Elisha is for two obvious reasons. First of all, I know that I've had kids pick on me before. Uh, I'm secure enough uh, in my who I am that the younger the kids are, the less I pay attention. I know who I am. And so for Elisha, who's God's main prophet, 
to get worked up over little four and five year olds. I, I just don't buy it. Uh, it's not going to happen. These so these had to be young men, or as it says, youths. Uh, secondly, we know that there is more going on here than just a few kids coming out to pick on him. When we read verse twenty four, that says. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the ewes. It doesn't say all of the ewes. It just says 42 of the ewes. And so when we read this, it could not it could be that 42 ewes couldn't escape and that there was more than that. I mean... Otherwise, it would have said all the youths, right? And so when we understand that these are young men, young adults, uh, and there's, it's, it's not just a few, it's a mob coming out, threatening, suddenly with this added information, we understand that this was probably not just a little group of children, right? Right? Uh, but more than likely a planned and organized group seeking to run Elisha off from a city steeped in idol worship. A place where some may have a vested interest in ensuring that the high place that King Jeroboam had set up in opposition to the altar of God did not lose its effectiveness. It, it, to me, it seems that these young men may have been worried that the people might break their idol worship and go back to worshiping God. And if that's the case, my question would be, why would these young men care who worshiped what? Right? I mean, seriously, why would so many use at least 42 why would so many of them care whether people worship God or worship an idol? Do what you want, right? I mean, these are kids. Why, why would they care? Do what you want. And even Joshua, Joshua mentioned long ago as they were coming into the promised land, he said, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your forefathers that they served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land you're dwelling in now. But as for me and my household, will serve the Lord. So even Joshua was like, serve who you want. Worship who you want. So why would all these youths come out and be like, oh no, we're not having this. We're not allowing you to come in and change the way things work. Why be so concerned? And to me, to me, I feel like it, the reason that they had to do this would be that they, they would have had to have a vested interest in it. I mean, let's think of it like this. If the king had set up priests for the high places to worship Baal and worship these idols, then surely the priests had understudies and apprentices that would eventually take over. And I wonder if these are those understudies. If these were the apprentices, the priests to be, and they didn't want to lose the power that they would be inheriting. It, it would make sense as to why there were so many of them gathered together in one place. To me, I think that is the case. I, I think that that is really what was going on there. And the reason I believe that is because of the next verse. Um, yeah, bears come out and maul the 42 ewes. And then the next verse, verse 25, the last verse of the chapter, says that Elisha um, went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. Remember, nothing is insignificant in Scripture. So when we read that he went to Mount Carmel, we realize that that's different than the trail that Elijah and Elijah were going. It's, it's all of a sudden this, something's different. And so we have to go, well, why is it different? What's, what's special about Mount Carmel? 
Well, when we understand, again, Scripture, it was on Mount Carmel that Elijah had the showdown with 450 prophets of Baal. And so I feel as though, just as Mount Carmel is attached to God's power shown against the prophets of Baal with Elijah, now Mount Carmel is again being attached to another victory of God with Elisha of those who would lead his people astray. So there we go. A minor moment in the Old Testament that really speaks to how jealous of a God we serve, right? Once in Exodus, again in Deuteronomy, God says, don't bow down and worship idols for I am a jealous God. He's not lying. And so first, while it appears God's punishment for this disrespect went a little too far, we have a choice to make. We can either doubt God's goodness or we trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not into our own understanding. But instead, in all our ways, we acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. The second thing I want to leave you with is this question. What do you worship? Do we truly trust in the Lord with all our heart? Or do we falter and fall to our knees to lesser things? Are we too often just as guilty as these youths? Do we chase after the things of this world? Or do we seek God's face in everything? Listen, as you go forth this week, seek. Seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. Trust in him with all your heart. Love the Lord fully. Don't bow to those lesser things, but instead follow God completely. Let's pray this morning. Almighty Father, again, we thank you and praise you for your grace and love. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word that uh, reminds us that there's nothing unimportant in it. And so, Lord, we ask that you continue to guide and direct us, continue to lead us. Lord, show us the lesser things that continue to trip us up so that we may put those away and seek your face. Again, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for everything you do for us and do through us. Continue to guide and direct, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, I thank you so much for... Uh, coming out and watching the video. We appreciate you watching our live stream as well as uh, making up each week that you miss maybe. Uh, so we appreciate it. Uh, ask that you continue to tune in and look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, God bless. Have a great week.